big list of guests at this month's uh, general meeting of the Texas Astronomical Society. These are all new guests. There's quite a few here. This is sort of getting into astronomy now and observation. Maybe my first time here, but I'm excited to go pursue it and uh, learn more about it. Welcome. How dark do you think we can make this room? I've got a number of slides that are really dark, and I've got a couple of demos that, uh, with lights that I'm going to need a dark room to be able to do this. So um, I'll trust you on this. But um, I've got a lot of slides I want to go through. It's a, uh, Talking about lighting, outdoor lighting is a very visual topic. So I've got a lot of stuff I want to show you. Um, let me get the uh, the shameless um, commercial for McDonald's Observatory out of the way. And then you guys, that's how we feel like it. That's how we like it. Um, I'd like to um, call your attention to McDonald's Observatory. If you haven't been, please come. Uh, we are located in the heart of the Davis Mountains. Um, out in far west Texas. Oh, from here I'd say it's about a 12 hour drive. I'm going to guess. Thereabouts. Haven't made the drive all the way through in a while, but uh, it's a fair piece. Um, we uh, have some of the largest telescopes in the world. The site has been here since 1932, is when McDonald Observatory was founded in this location. Uh, it's a good thing they chose this site, too, because one of the um, spots that they were actually considering back in the 1920s and 30s when they were looking for a place to house McDonald Observatory is off of Anderson Mill Road in what is now North Austin. Ooh. So we're very fortunate that we ended up uh, where we are. Um, the three largest telescopes pictured here are the 82-inch Otto Struva telescope, uh, the 107-inch Harlan Smith telescope, and the 365-inch, 9.2-meter uh, Hobby Everly Telescope. That's the largest telescope on the continent. It's um, tied for third place in the world in size. A major spectroscopic survey. Tele it, it looks pretty small from here, but that, that's over a mile away from, from where these two domes are. So it's, uh, it's a pretty big facility. And uh, you can come tour those telescopes seven days a week, year-round. I didn't do it. <laughs> We've got other screens. I'm going to go on. We do public star parties three nights a week. Uh, we see 60 to 100,000 people a year. Things have slacked off a little bit in recent years with the economy suffering the way it has. But uh, 60 to 100,000 people a year come through our star parties and our guided tours. Um, we've got uh, a bunch of telescopes ranging from 24 inches down. And um, more on the way, actually. 300 seat outdoor amphitheater, you can see that big circular structure, and somebody with a bright flashlight doing a constellation tour. Um, so we have a lot of fun with the public. It's year round. Uh, please do come and see us. So uh, let's talk about lighting. And the thing that I find most interesting is that this whole issue is really pretty young. The advent of the electric light bulb back in the late 1800s and its proliferation in the early 1900s, uh, we're talking what now, 100 years or so since, um, well, since it's largely taken over our night skies. This is a picture, a, a very low resolution picture of Mount Wilson, from Mount Wilson Observatory of the Los Angeles Basin. Um, and uh, to give you a sense of scale here, that's cool. Um, to see what it looks like today, we've got to zoom out a tad. And uh, that, this is 1908, by the way, 1908 when this photograph was taken. It's a one hour time exposure, give you an idea of what uh, the state of photography was back then. Uh, in 100 years later, in 2008, this is what we're looking at. Isn't that fun? In fact, you can just make out, I wish I had a laser pointer. Anybody, in this crowd, somebody must have a laser pointer. I failed to bring mine. Anybody? Hey, by golly. Yeah, Chaz has one. Yay. I, I, 
flew today and it was in a bag that I decided not to carry on the plane. Thank you, sir. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll be careful. <laughs> I really will. But uh, just to show you this is to scale, what, what I want to do is, is back, back up again and uh, point out this little, uh, uh, this little highway, uh, if I can see it here, this, this kind, of, kind of comes out right in there. If you look at that and then see it 100 years later, yep. it's right there. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So it's only been in the past 100 years or so that we have started to encase ourselves in these bubbles of artificial light. And the night sky is rapidly going away. The 100-inch telescope, which was the largest telescope in the world, by the way, and, um, for the longest time, uh, in 1939, when the 82-inch telescope was dedicated at McDonald Observatory, it was second only in size to the 100-inch. But the 100-inch today is, uh, it's not disused, but it's only about uh, maybe 40% efficient at what it was designed to do, which you see very faint objects because the sky there is just too bright um, so um, interesting what is happening in such a relatively short amount of time here is um, this is the uh, this, this is current or, or, or I should say this is from actual data this is a, co a piece of computer software wherein uh, city lights uh, as seen from the defense meteorological satellite um, uh, city, they, they use this to map out population growth and what have you. Uh, the spread of the spread of artificial lights is seen from space. Um, this data was collected in 1997, and that's why I, I uh, point out this is the actual one. But you can, they they kind of extrapolated backwards, and you can see what's happening uh, to our dark skies and projected into 2025. Um, it turns out. Um, well, some interesting things are happening. First off, and clearly, uh, the places where you can go to see truly, naturally dark skies are going away. Um, they're shrinking. They're becoming further, uh, fewer, fewer and farther between. And um, what is, what's happening that I think is really interesting is at the center of a lot of these dark spots are parks, national parks. The national park system in particular is starting to catch on that, oh my goodness, we are, like it or not, some of them are kind of being drugged along into this, uh, you know, feet first, kicking and screaming, but they are becoming the protectors, some of the last bastions of really naturally dark nighttime skies, and they are starting to recognize that the night sky is in fact um, a previously perhaps undervalued uh, part of their visitors' experience to the park service. So the National Park System has a night sky team that is quantitatively uh, and qualitatively evaluating the skies uh, in and around our national parks. And uh, some of them are, are very, very active. There are two parks in the country that are designated as international dark sky parks. One of them is Bryce Canyon. Uh, the other is uh, Big Bend where uh, in our neck of the woods. But um, the Grand Canyon does a, a, a pretty cool thing. This is a picture of the Grand Canyon Star Party last June. Uh, I was there and, um, well, I, I heard some people talking about uh, doing public outreach and there's some of you, you know, well, the gentleman that started up the, um, the Grand Canyon Star Party 22 years ago now, a guy named um, Dean Kettleson, uh, who works at the Seward Observatory Mirror Lab. He uh, was a member of the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Group, which is really a very large group, hundreds and hundreds of members, uh, kind of the, you know, the, the astronomy capital of the world, Tucson, Arizona. And as he likes to put it, there, there are some people that have that mental defect wherein they like to do public outreach. They like to do sidewalk <laughs> astronomy and set up their telescope. There's, there's different groups, and different interest groups in, in all astronomy clubs. But um, for the past 22 years, they've been driving telescopes up to the Grand Canyon uh, from Tucson. Uh, this past year, there were 80 telescopes set up. Um, the Park Service was wonderful uh, with traffic control and lighting. They made the auditorium available to us for, for talks. Um, and, uh, well, they were greeting people as you drive up to the park. You get your tickets saying, now, don't forget, this, the park doesn't close when the sun goes down. Come and see the stars. 
So the park service, it's kind of park by park. A lot of it depends on the rangers who are employed there. If there's somebody who's enthusiastic about astronomy on staff, then most likely you're going to have an active uh, public outreach program in astronomy uh, at the parks. But the two nights that I was there, there were over 1,200 people each night on the telescope field. And they do this for 10 days. So um, it's it's a, a great place uh, to go to see the sky, and it's uh, I think it's kind of a, a harbinger of, of things to come because the Park Service is finding itself the custodians of what's left of our naturally dark skies. It's kind of like a circle the wagons uh, mentality where they're starting to recognize uh, the need to adopt dark sky friendly lighting practices in the parks, in the communities around the parks. Um, so the Park Service may in fact become a major vehicle for promoting dark skies, for promoting outdoor lighting control. Here's a blob that may look familiar. Y'all recognize this? Houston, Dallas, Texas. There you go. I put the, the borders in. You can see where you are. And uh, it's not limited, by the way, just to the National Park Service. I'm going to put in some of the major parks here from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Just drop them in. Davis Mountain State Park here in Balmeray and Big Bend Ranch are big uh, dark sky sites uh, west, but there's lots and lots. Here's uh, your local neighborhood and the parks in the area. Now there's one park, new park, that's left out. We'll talk about it in a little bit, which is located right in here in between Strawn and Eastland, which is the Palo Pinto Mountains State Park. So. Um, the, uh, well, Texas Parks and Wildlife is also recognizing the night sky as uh, something that they want to start taking advantage of. The whole idea is they want to increase visitation. So they are hiring a lot of young, and I might add female often, which is neat because Texas Parks and Wildlife has been a little male dominated for a long time. So they're hiring a lot of young women who are being trained to do dark sky programming for the public. And uh, the ones that I've met and worked with are very enthusiastic, and um, that'll be interesting to see what develops with uh, Mr. Ferguson out of Palo Pinto. That's going to be pretty neat. Here is a um, sky glow map of uh, McDonald, uh, surrounding McDonald Observatory. Um, notice there's not just not a whole lot going on north of Pecos. I, I point this out just because uh, things have changed dramatically uh, as of late, but. Um, what we have done, and well, since 1978, there has been legislation on the state level that has enabled the counties, the seven counties, the way this language reads and why you've got this 57 air mile circle there, the language says something like any county, any part of which falls within 57 air miles of McDonald Observatory may adopt outdoor lighting ordinances designed to protect the night skies for scientific research ongoing at McDonald Observatory by name in the statute, in the state law, okay? Um, in uh, the, the first of last year, first of 2012, the language uh, has changed. It's uh, gone from these counties may adopt outdoor lighting ordinances to these counties shall adopt outdoor lighting ordinances and it includes all of the municipalities, all of the cities within. Now mind you, um, almost all of this area had already adopted lighting ordinances on from 78 on up uh, through uh, the, the 2000s. Um, since the first of 2012, Reeves County came on board, the city of Pecos, city of Fort Stockton, and just uh, about a week ago, Balmeray adopted an outdoor lighting ordinance. There's only one community left in this whole region, Presidio, which is yet uh, to adopt an ordinance, and we're on their city council agenda next month. So um, we expect them to join suit. This is a big chunk of land, folks. This is 28,000 square miles, all right? 18 million acres. Now, how far away is far enough not to bother you? Well, 
If you look at this graph, McDonald Observatory is at 6,800 feet on top of Mount Locke in the Davis Mountains. Uh, given that elevation above sea level, our horizon distance is about 100 miles. We could see car headlights, given a perfect horizon around us, we could see car headlights out to 100 miles. Uh, but we're ringed by mountains. But um, so you think, okay, over the horizon is, is uh, out of sight, so not a problem. It, it doesn't turn out to be true. Here's, here's some of the distances to, to some of the nearby communities. Notice El Paso is 160 miles away. 80 miles down to Presidio, 120 miles up to um, Odessa. Now I've got some, I don't know if these are going to be kind of dark, I don't know how well these will show up when I, when I put these up here, but um, yeah, it's working out okay, yeah. This is looking to the northeast from the catwalk of the 107 inch telescope. This is basically the Interstate 20 corridor um, going up. This is Midland, Odessa up in this area here. This is like Pecos. Uh, Balmeray. That's the city of Fort Stockton right there. Moving on eastward and southward, we see Alpine and then uh, the, the lights from Marfa, not the Marfa lights, <laughs> <laughs> the city lights from Marfa silhouette the Blue Mountain in the foreground nicely. And then 80 miles distant is Presidio Ojinagua. So um, a long way out and then turning off to the west. This is, um, this is obscene is what that is. That's, um, that is the Aerostat balloon. It's a radar balloon uh, that is flown by uh, Border Patrol, Drug Enforcement Agency. It's actually operated by the United States Air Force. And they have got, it's just a couple of acres of land, but they've got more floodlights all aimed out away from the balloon, like they're waiting for an attack or something. I'm not really sure what's going on, but that's something we've been having to deal with for a long, long time. But the brightest thing in our sky, as seen from McDonald Observatory, this 82-inch telescope here, the brightest thing in our sky, apart from the sun and the moon, is El Paso Juarez, 160 miles away. 60 miles beyond our horizon, right? There you go. And Van Horn happens to be, the city of Van Horn is right along the same line of sight with El Paso. Uh, but it's uh, three times closer. So inverse square law, any given light bulb is going to appear nine times brighter. So it has its own little stripe of light there. But it actually, the El Paso, 160 miles away, the dome of light, I mean, it, it goes through here like this. It's, a, um, it's quite the glow. I did a much longer exposure here to bring out something that I could see with my eye, but the camera wasn't picking up on shorter exposure. This is about a four-minute exposure on a... Uh, slightly overcast sky. This is El Paso, Van Horn in this direction. Notice the glint of light off the side of the 82 inch telescope dome. <laughs> That's what I was trying to capture to show to uh, the people that I work for that uh, over the horizon is not out of sight. Here's some data that was brought to my attention from a, a new spectrograph that's being developed for the Hobby Everly Telescope. They've got a, a big array of spectrographs, fiber-fed spectrographs, to do dark energy experiments starting uh, this summer. Uh, they hope to put all this on the, the 9.2 meter telescope. But um, uh, Matt Chitron, uh, the, the project manager there, uh, the, this is just sky glow. This isn't of any astronomical object. This is just a background sky glow. And he identified the blue lines as coming from high pressure mercury. And uh, the orange lines are from sodium. All right, so these sodium, you could argue, is naturally occurring. This is oxygen, by the way, which is naturally occurring in the atmosphere. But the mercury certainly is not naturally occurring. Now, I, there's an astronomer with UT Austin named Anita Cochran who has been doing cometary research for decades at McDonald using the 107 inch telescope. And she takes a spectrum of the comet and then toggles over and takes a spectrum of the background sky next to the comet and then back to the comet, back to the background sky. And I thought, oh boy, if we could get a hold of her archive of spectra of sky glow um, um, data, then we might come up with something. And she sat down with me one night and we came up with these plots. These are randomly selected, by the way, but um, here is the signature of Mercury again, these lines, 
and this is 1986 to 2005. Notice it's going away. Mercury fell out of favor. By the mercury vapor fell out of favor because of its toxicity and disposal, uh, and it's not really very uh, efficient in terms of how much light you get out of the electricity you put into it. And we've been putting up shields. We've uh, hung over 800 shields in communities around McDonald Observatory over the past 20 years or so, uh, or so shielding the uh, mercury vapor lights in the area. And I point this out only because, for me, it brings hope. It shows that in the course of a human lifetime, you can, in fact, make measurable, quantifiable changes to the quantity and quality of the sky glow um, that's uh, given off by artificial light, all right? So mercury is diminishing. That's encouraging. That tells me you can, in fact, do something about it. Uh, we have the uh, uh, dark sky brightness monitor. Um, it's a joint project for the International Dark Sky Association, the IDA, and Vatican Observatory. We have one located at McDonald. Um, we send out, uh, every quarter, we send out observers news to all the people who have time on the telescopes at McDonald Observatory. And this appeared in uh, an edition last fall. And it simply shows that during new moon that the skies at McDonald Observatory are as dark or are even darker than any other site in North America and comes close to certain lower <coughs> In fact, in Chile, this is new stuff. These, this is uh, this hasn't been put through that same software that puts the sky glow contours into it. That was Ciazano et al. back around 2000 published that uh, the World Atlas of uh, Artificial Sky Brightness, I think is what it's called, um, where you had those color contours like the earlier maps that we showed. This is uh, April of 2012. Uh, lights as seen from space uh, at night. And uh, I'm going to zoom in on some areas. Here's nearby McDonald. Um, these, I can tell you authoritatively, are two wildfires that were burning west of the observatory out by Mount Livermore. This is the Tejano Canyon fire right there. You can actually see the, the fingers going off up into the canyons there. So those aren't permanent fixtures. Um, this is Fort Davis right there. Alpine, Marfa, um, this is the, gold, the silver mine at Shafter, this is uh, Presidio, OJ, Van Horn, El Paso, Midland, Odessa, Pecos, but look at all this stuff. Anybody? Oil. Oil, Oil. Oil. gas. And this is fracking. Um, this is temporary, all right? I mean, they erect, they bring in these trailer-mounted floodlights and put up the 25-foot mast and aim their floodlights out sideways and light up the, the world around them. Um, and when they bring the well in, they take the light somewhere else and do it again. Okay, But it is temporary lighting, although we're also seeing a lot of flaring. When once the, the wells come in, um, they can't afford to either store it or transport it, so they just light it and they burn it off. That's what you see is as these gas flares burning at, at wells all around, and they're temporary too, uh, for the lifetime of the well, which could be, you know, 20, 30 years or so. But uh, it's not just happening in West Texas. Oh, this is looking now to the north. This is, yeah, this is uh, Midland, Odessa, down the I-20 corridor. This is all that fracking going on. Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, look at this down here. Mm -hmm. All oil exploration, all, all gas, gas fields. North Dakota, um, there are other major places where this is going on big time. This might look familiar, guys. Got some images here that Gary included. Um, it shows the location of the Palo Pinto Mountains State Park. Here's the sky glow contour map. So what is it to Fort Worth then? About 70 miles? Something like that? So, um, you know, it, oh, given your elevation there, it's probably just over the horizon as well. 
Here's a picture that Gary took while we were there last month, I guess it was. Um, this is the city of Strong, Texas, which is uh, just, what, maybe eight or nine miles uh, to the east. Um, this is the glow from Fort Worth. So we can deal with the stuff nearby, and we're just going to have to trust time, uh, good lighting to, to replace bad lighting uh, in the major metropolitan areas. So. Um, don't give up, but it's a very dark sky. Do you want to say anything? Do you guys want to, that were there, Glenn or, or Gary? You want to say anything about the quality of the night sky over the, the new site there, the new park? This is this is at the edge of the park, overlooking Tron, and there it, it was obvious. And it being an overcast night, you're seeing that light coming off the, the ground, being reflected right back down at you. Uh, once you get to the center of the park, which this park. I forget how many miles wide this thing is. It's a lot longer than it is yeah, tall. A lot yeah. longer than it is tall. And you get to the center of the park and you're right at the edge of silver versus gold on IDA's uh, night sky scale. So um, it's a very dark side overhead. It is a very dark side. It's going to be a really fantastic side to observe from, I think. Um, but the threats are the surrounding communities and the kinds of regulation that they're going to have to self-imposed if they want to preserve that. Strong's got a lot of, uh, of interest in this because they are serving as the gateway to this park. So we're, we're going to work with the council and, and try and get them to go out and put some cats on the lights that we've got out there that are already causing problems. Uh, but the bigger threat, in my mind, is going to be along the corridor of I-20. Mm -hmm. And when that starts developing and you start getting car dealerships, um, you know, they're, they're going to be problems. Yeah, I'm pointing mm -hmm. those right through here. Yeah, you're, seeing, you're seeing a little bit of it already. This is Eastland, I believe, and then Strong. Yeah. There. So, yeah. We don't go during football season on Friday night. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, we have a family farm uh, over in, uh, in Ranger, right between Eastland and Strong. Mm -hmm. And the light from both of those cities, it, 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 it's, it's insane uh, when there's a football game. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is good sports lighting available, you know, so yeah. it's, it's just a matter of getting the word out. You know, and we're on the agenda. I mean, I, I'm going to be speaking to the Strong City Council in April, um, shortly after the star party that you all are planning to host uh, there, I guess the first one at the Palo Pinto Mountain State Park, and we're going to talk about their lighting. <laughs> But I've got to tell you, having been doing this now for quite some time, dealing with uh, trying to keep the skies dark for McDonald Observatory, that's basically my mission, uh, or a big part of my mission at McDonald is to preserve the night skies. Otherwise, that facility will turn into a, you know, a restaurant overnight um, if, the, if the, the dark skies go away. But if it were dealing with all these individual lights, or this city, or that Walmart, or that hotel, I'd go, you know, I'd go bad because um, there's no shortage of bad lighting out there. But what I do see, again, that gives me hope, is the education efforts, the, the efforts to raise public awareness about what makes for good outdoor lighting, because we're, we're not against outdoor lighting, that's very important to emphasize. Um, that seems to be gaining a lot of traction. More and more people are understanding the difference between good lighting and bad lighting. Um, and if given a choice, they would prefer to have good lighting on their property instead of bad. So I think over time, we can actually make a big difference. Here's the kind of stuff we have in mind for Strawn. This is, Julie took this picture uh, outside uh, Mary's Restaurant in Strawn, Texas. And um, this is the type of fixture they've got bunches of. The good news is they can be retrofitted with the shield. All Are right. these being made now? I understood they weren't being made anymore. Um, the, the, the kind that were designed for the Dima head fixture, this style of fixture for, for it, outdoor lighting, are not being made anymore. However, they are still making the exact same kind of shield that's intended for high bay lighting. It's the same manufacturing process. It's um, spun aluminum, um, and it's made for warehouse high bay lighting, and you can take one of those lights and some self-tapping screws and just take this plastic thing off of there and 
screws the shield into the, the ballast housing, and you've turned a, a bad light into a good light. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But that is something that we want to propose to the strong city council. We need to learn from their utility provider, which is Texas, New Mexico Power, just how many of these light fixtures, uh, in fact, the city is renting or leasing or paying electricity for uh, from the local utility. And once we get that number in hand, we can talk about uh, how we can afford to purchase these at 20 odd dollars a piece. There may be, you know, uh, we're talking could be a couple three thousand dollars worth of shields. But the, the agreement we have out in West Texas with American Electric Power, uh, former West Texas utility, uh, AEP has honored an agreement that's over 20 years old now that if the observatory, McDonald Observatory, provides the hardware, replacement lighting or shields, and again, we've put up over 800 shields in the communities around the observatory. If we provide the hardware to the customer and the customer has it in hand, and then calls the utility and says, will you please come install this? You, the utility will come with their bucket truck and put it up for free, no charge. Okay, so that's the working arrangement we've gotten with our local utility and surrounding communities, and it's been working quite well. So something to keep in mind, but um, the city of Strong is not likely gonna wanna come up to pay for these things. So I don't know if you guys wanna pass the hat at some point along the way or just how to go about it, but uh, you can really knock down the light uh, from the city of Strong. Yeah. This was taken, I'm sorry, Jim. Could you go back to that other picture because that rectangular light to the left of the... Oh yeah, the other yeah. Is a, is yeah, we'll show, we'll show, I've got some pictures of this. Now, that's a floodlight right there that is doing a great job of lighting up the top of that tree. Underneath the tree. <laughs> Can't, I mean, th this light isn't doing anything for the ground. It's just, it's, it's probably slowly killing that tree because um, the tree never gets dark. You never sees darkness. We'll talk about that a little bit more as well. But I'll show you some pictures. The, here's one of those lights, not, not the flood, but the, the ones that will accept the shield. Uh, this was, was in Mango. We drove around, Julie and I drove around that evening when we were out visiting the park while, while Gary and Glenn and others were out doing the measurements and taking photographs uh, at, at the park site itself. Julie and I tried really hard to find examples of good lighting in the city of Strong and failed miserably. We, could, we couldn't find one good light fixture. We had to drive further down the road to Mingus. Um, but, but the thing to, to look for, if you're trying to document this stuff, here's one of these, these light fixtures, these glare bombs, the barnyard lights, whatever you want to call it. Notice how well lit the tops of the trees are, the tops of the telephone poles, the, the phone lines, down the road again, you got trees lit up. That's light, that's an indication you've got a lot of light going up into the sky. It's just pure waste. It's not doing anybody any good at all. We back out a little bit here. There's the same fixture in, in home. Oh, you might, you might notice that all the blinds are drawn here. Yeah. You know, it's like, Ugh. you know, leave us be. Um, we did find good what these are these are good lights over the entrance to this facility. But here's here is a floodlight aimed at the top of the building. Here's another floodlight lighting up this tree and from, from this from another angle. There's that flood lighting up that tree. And again, notice how much useful light is actually making it to the ground. So this is the kind of stuff that, that usually, especially if somebody's paying hundreds or even thousands of dollars a year to light a piece of property, is this how they want to spend their money? They lighten up the top of a tree. Um, so there's a lot of good arguments to be made uh, for financial reasons uh, to adopt a good outdoor lighting practices. But this recessed lighting over the entryway here was the only good lighting that I was able to find until we got down to the freeway uh, where Textile is doing some stuff. So yeah, let, let's talk about talking to communities about good lighting. Um, I, I'm lucky if I can get five, ten minutes in front of the city council or a county commissioner's court, and I will usually lead with this slide because I want to point out to them it's not true. Right? This, they hear I'm an astronomer, I'm coming from McDonald Observatory, I want to talk about preserving the dark sky, and I want to talk about outdoor lighting control. 
the assumption that a lot of people jump to before I even show up is he is coming to try and talk us into turning our lights off. He wants us to pull the plug, take our lights away from us, leave us in the dark. No safety, no security at night. I just can't emphasize strongly enough we are not against outdoor lighting at night. We are in favor of certain kinds of outdoor lighting at night. Um, there is good lighting to be had. Here is a picture of the city of Tucson. This is actually looking out over the University of Arizona campus. Um, from the top of the five-story building, the old Plaza International Hotel, and Tucson has had a lighting ordinance in place since 1973 because of their proximity to our National Observatory at Kitt Peak. Uh, and most of the lighting in Tucson is good. It's remarkable. You can see the Milky Way from city limits. All right. Um, but the facilities here that do not conform to the local ordinance are standing out like sore thumbs. You've got a swimming pool complex here. I don't know what this is or, or this. But you can see the light going skyward. Again, we're on a, on a five-story building looking down onto the city, so you shouldn't see any bare naked light bulb. You've got this, this swimming pool complex here. This is a tennis court complex. Notice how well lit the tennis courts are, but you don't see the bare naked light bulbs lighting up from above. You, you're looking down on the light. You don't see where it's coming from. There's, Shoe box are full cut off, fully shielded fixtures on the tops of these poles. Same thing with the street lighting. Um, you've got well lit streets, sidewalks, intersections, but you don't see the source of the light. They're on the tops of these poles. Okay, lighting up below. Here's one silhouetted right there. And all the way down <coughs> the street, uh, you can see good lighting in Tucson. And yes, you can see the Milky Way from U of A campus. So when I talk to groups, I try and make every argument I can. Not, not many people are going to respond to the dark sky stuff. Okay, One in ten, if we're lucky, are going to say, yeah, it's important to be able to go outside and see the stars at night. Um, gosh, we're raising generations of people, folks, that have never seen a truly dark sky. Um, I was... Uh, at a restaurant in downtown Austin some months ago, outdoors, at night, talking to a group of acquaintances and just asking, so what do you think you might be missing by not living under a really dark sky, not being able to see the stars at night? And the first response I got was a guy that said, what are you talking about? The sky's dark. There's, <laughs> there's a star over there. He was serious. I mean, he didn't know any different. And the guy was in his 30s. He'd never seen the Milky Way. So you can appeal to the love of astronomy or the, the glory and splendor of the night sky. It's a good appeal to make. It's, it's actually a lot more important to me now than it used to be. I always focus on the economy end of things. But you're not going to get everybody with that, um, although I try. Here's the obligatory. I've got a question. I lost the star of night. Hmm? I've got a question on that picture. Are we? Can we tell that we're looking at like a, a light, you know, the light source? Is each one of those dots on the street, you know, we're looking directly at the light source, or are we looking? Well, at in, in this image, it's kind of hard to tell. I've, I've seen some of this original photography, and it's it's pretty bad. This is Chicago, uh -huh. um, and it's yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, so I couldn't <laughs> tell you. I was just wondering if there was yeah, any way to kind of interpret the picture. Most of the lighting there, you're seeing the direct bare naked light bulb, would be my guess. But um, what if Van Gogh were alive today? The Starry Night, right? He painted that in 1889 in San Remy, France. And I was losing sleep one night, couldn't, couldn't get to sleep. I got out uh, my Photoshop forger's brush and uh, went to work on Starry Night. What if Van Gogh were alive today? Well, <laughs> would he be inspired to paint this picture? I mean, he actually, if you, if you read biographies of Van Gogh, he actually left Paris 
I mean, back in the 1800s, he left Paris to get away from the light so he could paint the star. And there are, you know, as you know, there are half a dozen beautiful star paintings by Van Gogh, but if he were alive today, so we see this happening a lot more and more um, parks and um, areas being designated as dark sky reserves. This is in Scotland. Um, people are flocking to West Texas, actually. Sierra La Rana is a, an 11,000 acre tract of land that's been divvied up into high dollar home sites. And in 2009, they uh, offered up an interest inventory to anybody shopping for property at Sierra Colorado, whether it was in person, over the telephone, or online, they asked them, they, they gave them this survey, this interest inventory. What is drawing you to shop for property here at Sierra Colorado? This is about 10 miles south of Alpine, Texas, down towards Big Bend Park. And almost twice the nearest competitor is a strong dark sky related stuff. So people, you know, baby boomers, aging out, downsizing, empty nesters, however you want to think of it, a lot of people are flocking back out to dark sky sites because, so, you know, a lot of us grew up under dark skies and uh, lost touch with them for the longest time. So hiking, photography, uh, wildlife viewing, and fishing. Fishing. Haven't spent much time in West Texas, folks. <laughs> Pretty hilarious. It, it, it actually calls into question all the validity of all this data. Fishing in Arctic. So they didn't say what they were fishing. <laughs> okay. So here's the old bad stuff, the old classic mercury vapor barnyard light. This is the flat lens coat we had. This is the, the good stuff, the newer stuff that uh, is being used widely. Um, this is what used to be on the market, Julie. The Hubble, Hubble Lighting, Gus General Electric, Sylvania, they would offer these barnyard fixtures in two varieties with this uh, reflecting uh, uh, lens that, that just is basically designed to scatter the light everywhere, and it does a pretty good job at that, <laughs> everywhere including up, uh, or a clip-on shield that uh, I was getting them for $17.50 a piece uh, in quantity uh, for the longest time. And um, well, this is where the whole cost efficiency argument enters into it. Because if you don't waste all this light skyward and you focus it back down on the ground, Strange things happen. Here's a picture um, of a street corner in Ames, Iowa. Dave Esper took this picture, uh, gosh, back in the 80s now, I guess, of a mercury vapor light, 175 watt, on a street corner, residential street, uh, before it had the shield installed, and then after the shield was installed. All right? Now, I'll call your attention to a couple of things here. Well, well, first off, I had a five-year-old child call my attention to the fact that this picture was clearly taken in the summer, and this picture was clearly taken in the winter. <laughs> but apart from that, notice the amount of light making it to the street, first off. All right? Um, before the shields, but check out this second-story window of, of this house up here. All right? What, what if this is your bedroom? So Dave, being the kind of guy he is, got a light meter out and measured, walked off, set the meter on the ground, horizontal foot candle, measuring how bright the light is on the ground, out to 100 feet away from this pole, and came up with this nifty little graph. 175 watt mercury vapor light without the shield attached. This is the, well, okay, this is the distance out from the pole to 100 feet. This is the intensity of light and foot candles on the ground. Right at the pole, this is how bright it is without the shield attached. With the shield attached, this is how bright the light is on the ground. If you do the math, the difference between those curves turns out to be 47%. Half again as much light on the ground with the shield as without it. You're getting more light on the ground with the shield. So, for a time, Hubble Lighting 
was actually selling these shields as part of the kit. They would sell you the shield and they would sell you a 100 watt high pressure sodium bulb designed to work in the same ballast as the 175 watt mercury vapor bulb and they were saying get the same amount of light on the ground for less money, less electricity cost. Okay? This is what kind of started getting people's, uh, getting them aware, getting, getting attention called to the fact that you can actually get as much illumination on the ground um, for lower cost, lower wattage light bulbs, using less electricity. This is the Flatlands Cobra Head. These are all over the state of Texas. In 1999, former Governor Bush signed a bill into law requiring any state-funded lighting to conform to this standard. TxDOT, Texas Department of Highway, uh, the Texas Department of Transportation, uh, was the first agency to adopt this. Actually, before the bill was designed, designed uh, was signed into law. Um, and these are going up all around the state. I, I see them everywhere. Um, so keep an eye out for them. They, they are available in the Sadlands variety. You can get them with the Flatlands or the Sadlands. The Sadlands, not so good. You get the light from coming off this refractor down here can still go up. So you're getting light wasted and you've got glare going down the street that's not doing you any good. Um, but this is what Textile is doing, thankfully. This is what you'll see all around Dallas. Um, any major freeway interchange, high mass lighting, put up a 200 foot pole, cluster floodlights around the top and aim it down. Light up a big area with, instead of using hundreds of fixtures, just use a half a dozen brighter. So th this is good lighting. Texas Department of Transportation is leading by example uh, in this kind of street lighting. Oh golly. This is a stripes. Do you all have stripes up here? No. No? Okay. This is a, a convenience store service station chain that, that bought out a, a, a chain called Town and Country some years ago, uh, way back when, when gasoline was $2.74. <laughs> and uh, this is what they did in Alpine. And they, they, they retrofitted everything, including the, the gas pump lights and the dock lights around the building. And uh, well, they weren't, didn't make people in Alpine do that. Here's across the street. Uh, Notice how well lit the tops of the trees are. And this is what they did. They, they put in that new lighting in violation of the Alpine City Ordinance. They got a, a visit from their code enforcement officer. And we talked to them about what to do. And this is what they did. Full cut off LED flush mount gas pump canopy lights. Same thing with the dock lighting around the building. Um, and what's really cool, what makes the Straps folks really happy, they went from burning 6,700 watts per gas pump canopy to 1,200 watts wow. per gas pump canopy. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. 500 stores statewide, ka-ching, ka-ching. They're really thrilled with this. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff that more and more, I've seen shell stations now and some Texacos that are adopting it. Here's, a, here's Stripes and Marble Falls. Now, mind you, it's still way over lit. This is far more light than it needs to be. <coughs> but at least it's not shining up into the sky or, or even off property. You can see that there's very little sideways illumination there. Check out the footprint of these wall packs. These are LEDs mounted on the wall and you can see the lights going down into the sides. Same with the parking lot lighting. Good lighting. This is the kind of thing to promote. This is the kind of thing when you go in to buy gas or whatever, talk to the manager and say, I love your lighting. You know, this, is, this is the kind of stuff that gets people's attention. Here is uh, the retrofit done at the Big Bend National Park. Um, took three years, and if you count in-kind goods and services from Musco Lighting, probably about half a million dollars to do all this. Um, they put in, they took out all their old incandescent stuff and put in LED lighting. Um, boy, you should have seen it before. It was pretty hilarious. 
they, they had some wall sconces mounted like right about where those signs are at each of the doors and they were flush against the wall so in fact the light was shining out here the, where you open the doorknob and the lock where you put the key in was actually in the shadow you couldn't see it okay <laughs> and i'll point out to you that each one of these is one watt what? those are one watt leds how many um well i don't know exactly how many one, in each, uh, one in each lamp one in each lamp yeah each one of the, each one of those is a one watt led Here's what they did in terms of their power consumption. Whoops, hang on, let me get this one first. This is before and after, and this is an infrared, so you color enhanced to bring it out. But you can see this is the Chisos Basin. They were casting shadows up on Casa Grande. I mean, they were lighting up the mountainside all around. Uh, I know some park rangers who've been, been there for decades, and they, you know, it's, we can see the sky better than we ever could before. Um, and you can see how. But here's what they did in terms of power consumption. This was what they were burning before. This was at uh, Panther, Jun Panther Junction headquarters. There's three parts of the park that have been retrofitted. Panther Junction, the Chisos Basin, and Rio Grande Village down on the river. This is what they were burning in terms of wattage uh, with their incandescent lights. They were contemplating going to compact fluorescence because they were lower wattage before they got this grant money from Moscow Lighting to do LEDs. So they went from burning over 2,200 watts to 112. 98% <coughs> reduction in power consumption. Okay? It's remarkable. It really is remarkable. Now I'm told on the phone that in practice it's more like 90%. Oh, shucks. You know, they're still, they're saving a ton of money and they're, they're, they're using active controls. I mean, the questions to ask when you're, when you're buying a light or trying to light an area for safety to be able to see where you're going, what is it you want to light up and why? If, if you're trying to provide light in the middle of the night so the criminal can see which window to break in better, maybe you should put that light on a switch or a motion sensor or something. So positive control, for example, at the gas pump, uh, at the gas station, they've got uh, the, the, the LED canopy lights over the gas pumps burn at 8 watts until a car pulls up, then they ramp up to 64 watts for 10 minutes, the car pulls away, goes back down to 8. Okay, so positive controls is another good way to save a, a chunk of change. You'll see good lighting and bad lighting all over. This is Marble Falls. Again, I'm not trying to pick on Marble Falls, but they're one of the, the more, more recent places that I've taken some pictures. Um, this wasn't quite dark yet, so not all of these lights have turned on, but they've got some nice full cutoff shoebox fixtures for parking lot lights. And then they've got these floods that are intended to light up the facade of the building. <laughs> okay, and, and notice how they're aimed. Um, sideways, <laughs> which boggles my mind. Um, I'm not going to worry about dimming it. The room's not really that dark to begin. I think I can uh, just dim the center one if I can do this. Uh, wow, modern technology. Let's see here. I brought this little floodlight that you can pick up at True Value or what have you and uh, paint the inside of your house at night with, but it, it, it serves as a good analog to, a, to an outdoor floodlight. And what people do with these things, again, is aim them sideways so they can light up the biggest piece of property with the fewest number of light fixtures possible. So you see them on poles aimed sideways like this. Now, sorry about the glare I'm causing here. But when you aim a floodlight sideways, where's the light going? Sideways. Up and down. I mean, half of the light's going up half the lights going down. So what we ask people to do, and what's pretty straightforward to do if you've got a step ladder and a screwdriver, is to re-aim these floods. Um, let's say our property line is the chalkboard, uh, the, the base of the chalkboard where the erasers are over there. So let's aim this light down to try and keep our light, number one, out of the sky, and number two, on our property, keep our light on our property. Aim this thing down, well, once you go below the horizontal, like that, it's no longer really that much of a threat to the night sky. You're going to get a little scattered going up. 
and some glare, which we'll talk about. But once you get below the horizontal, um, you're not lighting up the sky as much. And I might also add, notice the amount of light you're getting now underneath it. At the base of the pole, it's dark down here. Now you get some light underneath it. But you may have a neighbor with a bedroom window a couple of blocks down the street. So let's keep it coming on down until that light footprint lands on your property line. Your light stays on your property, your neighbors get the better night's sleep. Okay? And then there's the issue of glare. <laughs> if this room were really dark, that'd have been painful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It really didn't mean to hurt you. But, uh, <laughs> so re-aiming floodlights is something really simple. In fact, we've, we've been working with some state parks out in the Region 1, the West Texas area, who had floodlights clustered around headquarters buildings all aiming out uh, with just you know simple road going around the headquarters building. They, they aimed them down onto the road. They're no longer shining light out over the campgrounds and stuff. So um, they like it. Here is the floodlight taken to the extreme. This is a, a billboard on West Interstate 10 uh, outside Fort Stockton. There are 4,000 watt metal halide floodlights right there lighting up that billboard at night. <laughs> yeah, you know, would you want to be paying electricity bill for this? Where is the light going? Here's the same idea. This is uh, La Quinta, no, excuse me, Hampton Inn. Um, take a little closer look at these floods. These are building facade floods. They're supposed to be decorative. They're supposed to light up the side of the building. Uh, you can see they're aimed actually away. I mean, you're getting light on the side of the building, but most of the light is going away up into the sky. Hampton Inn um, opened a branch in Alpine, uh, and they did it against city ordinance. Again, so we had a little talk. Uh, the owner was very understanding. Um, we, uh, well, like so many of these nationwide change, it's, it, it, it's a cookie cutter design. They've already got the floor plan, they've already got the lighting plan, the plumbing plan, all that stuff is, is, uh, is standard across all of the different franchises. Um, and they're three-story buildings and they have very nice full cut-off shoebox parking lot lights on 25-foot poles uh, lighting up where the cars park. Uh, so I got with the owner, we identified the breaker. There's all of these building facade floodlights were on the same breaker, on the same circuit. So we turned off that breaker and went out and sat on the hood of the car and looked at what we saw. He was perfectly happy with the amount of light he was getting just from the parking lot lights onto the side of the building. He thought it looked better. <laughs> Put a piece of tape across that breaker. Those floodlights haven't come back on since. He's saving over $1,000 a year on his electricity bill. Okay? It just makes sense to folks. Ah, then the glare. See, glare hampers visibility. If you can see the bright light source in your eye, then you've got a problem with, with being able to see. Uh, and it's not good vision. Here's a, an example of a floodlight aimed at you and then aimed down. Again, what is it you want to light up um, is a question to ask yourself. And I've got one more demo. This is where I really need it to be dark to do this, but I'll just suffer through and see if this works. Um, hmm. Where to do this so everybody can see? I'll just try it right here. Dude, th this works great in classrooms. You've got to be able to get a dark room, though. But classrooms, kids of all ages, adults of all ages, double A mag light. We've got a piece of property here. We're going to try and light it up using this lamp post. <laughs> okay, now I don't know if you guys can see this because it's not real dark in here, but most of this light is going up. You know, I can't see any shadow on the ground. And there's actually a nice shadow on the piece of property that you're, you're trying to light up. So if you take a shield and catch the light that's going up and bring it down, you end up lighting up the property. 
Now, I can't see the shadow in your eye, but when two things are happening here. One is you're reclaiming the light that's being wasted skyward. You're reflecting it down to the ground. You're lighting up the property that you're trying to light up. And number two, when you get the, the shield to the right spot, the light bulb disappears from view. When, when the light bulb, when that bare naked bulb is visible directly to your eye, you've got glare. The visibility is not as good. When you get the shield down over it and the light source disappears from view, your visibility goes up. Okay? So um, try this sometime. Okay. Here's a photographic representation of the same. These are the wonderful, decorative, they look great in the daytime, acorn fixtures. Notice how well lit the trees are above. Uh, and then the full cutoff variety with the shield that directs the light down. Notice the human being standing here and here. Same human being is standing here and here. Okay. So the glare in your eyes from the bare bulb makes it more difficult to see. Lots of good light fixtures on the market. I'm just going to zip through these in a bit of a hurry. These are from the folks at Glare Buster. Named this after Dave Crawford, founder of the IDA. RAB Cooper Lighting makes these 50 watt high pressure sodium. You can get them that low wattage. This is 70 watt on the spec sheet. But um, uh, even wall packs can be had as a full cutoff optic. And the ornamental stuff, the old period gas light fixtures. These are full cut off dark sky friendly fixtures. The light source is up in the hoods and it's coming down. The light's going down, not up. And it looks great in the day and it works at night. Now this picture got stretched. I just, I, I just got this, um, some of you may have already seen this. Scott Cardell, the managing director of the IBA, sent out uh, a link. This is at a Lowe's hardware store uh, in Arizona. And there is actually a dark sky friendly lighting section here. It's kind of hard to pick it out, but here you go. These are the, the kinds of, I think a lot of people call them warehouse fixtures is a, a term for a lot of them, these wall sconces. Um, these are good shielded lights. And they've got a little information display here talking about reducing light pollution and enhancing the dark sky lessen the impact of uh, light on the ecosystem, reduce glare, uh, light trespass, well, intruding light on neighbor's house is what they say, minimize energy and cost, uh, uh, operating costs, improve visibility, safety, and security. Uh, this is how they're marketing this stuff. And, you know, some nice graphics. And uh, this is the kind of thing that, that all of these hardware stores can be doing. Um, <coughs> Again, these pictures are they're not formatted quite right, but you, uh, we're talking under twenty dollars for these things. There's an Ace Hardware store, um, Higginbotham's in Fort Davis, Texas, and I've been trying like mad to get them to carry stuff like this, but it's not in the Ace inventory. It's not in the True Value hardware inventory. We're talking nationwide chains that don't stock this stuff, these types of fixtures. They don't stock this stuff in their warehouses. But what I've been able to do is convince them to go ahead and purchase just a couple of these to have on the shelves for customers to see, and they can special order them. The, the, the Ace or the True Value chain store can't stock them on the shelves, but they can put them on the display, on display and, and uh, offer to special order them for customers that request them. Okay. So there is a way to deal with that. Well, it's not in our inventory, so we can't carry them. They can. They just can't stock them. They can't special order them. Last but not least, um, the artificial, the consequences of artificial light on the ecosystem. Light at night. This is the, the, the last argument that I have started making as far as uh, good reasons to keep artificial light out of the sky at night and out of your bedroom, bed, your neighbor's bedroom window. Consider that every living, or, every living organism on the planet evolved in a diurnal cycle. Day-night. 
dark light. Um, circadian rhythm is uh, what the biologists call it. Um, today, it's not day, night, day, night. It's day, twilight, day, twilight. It never really gets dark in and around our major population centers. And what studies are showing, as far as, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff to talk about plant life and on, you know, uh, mammals and all kinds of, uh, of wildlife impact on the ecosystem. I'm not an expert on that stuff, but if you Google light pollution and health, if you do a Google search, you will find dozens of published papers demonstrating links between all kinds of adverse health consequences and excessive exposure to artificial light at night. Now this is, you know, the, the classic shock, scare, sensational headline, cancer causes cancer. Well, okay. But if you consider the fact that disrupting your circadian rhythm, your day-night cycle, leads to sleep disturbances, suppressed immune system. If you have a suppressed immune system, you are susceptible to just about anything and everything that can alien. So, you know, a lot of people, like the people in that house in Strawn that had their blinds drawn. I mean, there, somebody was probably trying to sleep in one of those rooms. They knew better than to have all that light coming in, just, just intuitively. People will go around, uh, you know, with electrical tape blocking out the LED pilot lights on their television or whatever it is, just so they can sleep in a dark room at night. And, the, and then there's this. These are floodlights on the side of a La Quinta um, that are, well, shining in the bedroom windows. I mean, I understand they're trying to light up the facade of the building, but there are other ways to do that without shining in to where people are trying to sleep. So just to sum it up, these are the four main arguments to use when you're talking to people, again, if one of them doesn't get them, the other one may. Um, the dark sky issue, again, what are we losing by not having access to a naturally dark night sky environment? The cost efficiency, I hope I've been able to demonstrate that uh, issue to your satisfaction. You can get more light on the ground for less money if you just use the right types of fixtures. Then safety and security, that's where the glare comes in. Glare hampers visibility, reduces safety and security. And then the health issue, uh, which is gaining a lot of steam. Uh, the AMA, the Medi uh, American Medical Association, uh, two years in a row now has passed resolutions identifying artificial light at night as a health hazard. So lastly, here is uh, a couple of pictures taken 24 hours apart. Uh, of a blackout on the eastern seaboard in 2003. People, people were calling up 911, what's that in the sky? Um, when they restored the lights the next night, you can see the difference. I, I guess the, the reason I, I throw this in and, and the point I'm trying to make is that unlike other um, environmental issues like uh, the extinction of the species or stuff that you can't undo, we're not doing any harm to the night sky. It's still there. All we're doing is cutting off our access to it. We're encasing ourselves in these bubbles of artificial light at night. Um, so in theory, you can fix this overnight or with the flick of a switch, in theory. Okay. I, I've often thought what we really need is another good energy crisis. I say another. A really good energy crisis, one of the first places people might turn to is you know, wasting all this light to light up the tops of trees in the sky at night. Uh, good place to uh, cut down on energy waste. So I am done. And I thank you all for your kind attention. Anybody else? Plan to come down here and do this demo. Will you? You, you want me to do it, huh? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to electrocute myself, but I'm sure the way this is gone.
Go ahead and put this demo together. I, I, I've got to tell you um, a, 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 just a quick story. I, I spoke at Enchanted Rock State Park. <laughs> Did it work? What? <laughs> okay, let, let's just have a look. Here you go. Wow. Yeah. Now, again, it's not really dark in here, but you can see the difference, I hope, in terms of visibility. And see, this, this compact fluorescent is, is, the wattage is a little high, so it's kind of sticking down below. You need a shorter bulb. You need a shorter bulb. But this is the stuff that the jelly bean or the, the, you know, the jar fixtures, the jelly jar fixtures. Just a, a simple side-by-side -side comparison makes all the difference. I was speaking in, in Enchanted Rock State Park a couple of months ago, and uh, a gentleman named Kyle Biederman, who owns Ace Hardware in Fredericksburg, Texas, showed up um, with a plywood stand and a board across the top. He had four different light fixtures screwed onto it and plugged them in in succession and showed everybody. And this guy showed up, he says, okay, I've read about this stuff, I've heard about this stuff, but it wasn't until last night at home in my garage when I compared these lights side by side, uh, that, duh, it hit me. Let me show you what I am learning. I mean, it was very much a come to Jesus kind of moment. I mean, the guy <laughs> had been converted, and he is now carrying the good stuff on his, on his shelves at the hardware store in Fredericksburg. So um, it's seeing is believing with this kind of thing. Uh, again, with the exposure of the bare bulb to your eye, the visibility ain't so great. So the amount of light making it to the ground. Just check out how well lit the carpet is with this fixture compared to that. Mm -hmm. See the difference in terms, just in terms of visibility, sir? It's the same body, the ball, and the texture, they're exactly the same. Same exact ball. Same, same exact ball. Um, in fact, you could get, again, you could get the same amount of illumination on the ground with a lower wattage bulb here. Okay? And the other thing to look for, in addition to the intensity, um, how bright the bulb is, is the color, the color temperature. This stuff is blue, very bluish, very blue rich, um, probably around 6,000 degrees Kelvin, and this is around 2,700 degrees Kelvin. Um, this, this, you can buy these lights, if you look at the packaging, they'll tell you the color temperature rating. The, the 2700 degrees Kelvin bulbs are designed to mimic incandescent light. This is in, the color is intended to look more like an old time incandescent screw in bulb. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff you want to look for. It just so turns out, it just happened to turn out that the blue light actually is more disruptive to your circadian rhythm at night than is the, the more yellowish light. Okay, so the higher frequency stuff stimulates your brain more so. Okay. Thanks, Glenn, for bringing that. Questions, anybody? Sir? Yeah, uh, some of the, the worst violators around here are these beautiful churches with steeples with crosses on top. But to illuminate them, the light has to go up. And I can well imagine that uh, unless you offer a solution, those churches are not going to turn out their lights. Right. Um, use a spotlight instead of a floodlight. Use a lower wattage spotlight instead of a floodlight. Okay, floodlight, wide beam. You got light going. Yeah, you got some light hitting the steeple, but most of the light's going around the steeple and, and above it and beyond it, out into the sky. If you focus the beam using a spotlight, you can lower the wattage, get more light on what it is you're lighting up. Same thing with the flag on the pole. I mean, the idea is really to take your flags down at sunset, but that's you know a whole different story. But if you shine a spotlight on the object you intend to illuminate, again, what do you want to illuminate? What is it you're trying to light up? If you use a floodlight, you get some light on your steeple, but most of it's going to round it up into the sky. Concentrate that into a narrow beam of the spotlight and hit your target. And you, you waste less light skyward and you can do it for a lower wattage. Is anyone aware of uh, any conversations Right. Yeah. It was it was that that uh, 
new shop from space in 2012. Mm -hmm. You know, when I started looking at that, when that showed up on the web, Dallas is beginning to be one of the biggest offending, Dallas Fort Worth, I should say, one of the biggest offending cities in the nation now. I mean, it's really getting awful close. I think, was that Raleigh, North Carolina, down? I don't know what it was over on that side, and then up in New York City area were the three major mm -hmm. contributors. To yeah, if you look at all the light pollution along the east coast of that whole corridor there, it explains a whole lot yeah. about what's going on but along the east coast. You know, we, we <laughs> sleep Texas disturbing. Astronomical Society has uh, screening rights to the movie, the film called The City Dark. I don't know if you got to see it when we screened it here once, um, but um, very interested in, in getting some of the town councils to come to a venue where we can show that film to them and, and, uh, and, and maybe even get yeah, you to, to work with us. If, if, you get a ch if you get a chance to see the city dark, by all means do. It, it, it goes a long way in addressing bullet point number one, <coughs> the loss of the dark night sky and the impact that has on all of us. But it doesn't really go a whole lot into lighting practices. The lighting technology. Oh, very light on that. I so, think. so it's the kind of movie. It's a great opportunity. You, you show the movie as a, an appeal to the emotional side of losing the night sky, and then you have a discussion afterwards about what makes for good lights versus bad lights. Okay, what you can actually do about it. So, if you show that movie, do it in two parts. Yeah. My recommendation. Anybody take a guess as to what the brightest city per square foot is as seen from space? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. 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 Yes, sir. I was wondering uh, about the uh, uh, education as far as like architects. It seems to me a lot of this it, it could be solved by architects designing the right lines. Yeah. Well, the, the IDA has worked for decades with the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America, the ISNA. They are the people that design uh, and and recommend you know the manufacture of, of different styles of fixtures and that's why we're seeing as many good fixtures as we are they're still overwhelmed by the bad fixtures out there but look at what the state of texas has done with state-funded lighting um you know but they have to go along with all like you know, the hotels where the light's pointing up i mean they just use the light pointing down or whatever yes. Right, well, agree, agree. You know, I would like nothing more than to get a room with this many people, this, of architects or lighting engineers or, or what have you. Um, so it's just, you know, it, it's a matter of picking away at it, but, you know, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends. Um, it, it really is pretty straightforward. Probably the, the best thing you can do is lead by example. Get your own property lit well, your own home, your own business, Use good lighting there first and use it as an example to show people. Identify examples of good lighting installations in your community. I'm sure there are stores nearby within <coughs> short driving distance of where we are, maybe some lights on campus that are good lights. Use those as examples. Take What I often do is invite the city council members out to dinner, let it get dark, take a little tour around town. Show them, and I take. I don't show them the bad stuff. I take and show them the good stuff. Here's the good lighting. This is what good lighting looks like. And again, seeing is believing. Most people will say, "Well, yeah, of course. I don't want to be lighting up my neighbor's bedroom window three blocks down the road. I want to keep my light on my property, and I'd like to save some money in the process." It all makes perfect sense to people. It's just. I don't know, since the advent of the electric light bulb, brighter is better, has kind of been the mantra. And uh, it's just an educational thing to get that turned around, get that perspective of, of, of good lighting. And again, it's not anti-light. You need to be able to see to get from your car to your back door, from your garage to, to your door. So put the light where you need it and, and only where you need it and when you need it. I mean, if you're burning a, a barnyard light at three o'clock in the morning, while you're in bed asleep, who are you providing the light for? I mean, there is no correlation, no demonstrable correlation between lighting and crime, folks. No study. Some go this way, some go that way, but there's no conclusive evidence that there's any relationship, one way or the other, between lighting and crime. 
So put the light where you need to see, and nowhere else. I mean, it's just, just that simple. Okay, thanks again. Really appreciate it.